For LMC Media, I'm Maura Carlin. I'm speaking with Meg Koifer of the Coalition for Community. Meg, thank you for joining us. And of course, the first question is, what is the Coalition for Community? Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm happy to speak here on behalf of the Coalition. The Coalition for Community is what it sounds like. It's a coalition, it's a group. And in this case, it's a group of nonprofits that work together to respond to large scale crises or problems in our community. Um, it formed really at the height of the pandemic in March. Um, when the pandemic was setting in, uh, and many people were going to the Community Resource Center to ask how they could help. And in some ways that is fantastic because uh, the um, Community Resource Center has direct contact with a lot of people in our community who have very high level needs. On the other hand, that was overwhelming for the Community Resource Center. If we could find a way to coordinate services, then we could help both each nonprofit that was engaged with that community, and we could um, really make a difference around large scale problems. So this group formed, um, I myself, I, I really had the idea of it. I spoke to a bunch of different nonprofits and said, what if we got on some phone calls on a regular basis and talked about the problems that are facing our community during this absolutely unprecedented time of the pandemic. And we've been- So meeting, you've, been work, you've been meeting for about a year and a half at this point. Correct. I was going to say we've been meeting ever since. Um, at the height of the pandemic, we were on calls once, or excuse me, two or three times a week. Uh, and then we went to uh, weekly or monthly as needed. And then obviously, I think speaking to the power of this model, um, when the flooding hit in um, you know, early September, we were able to completely reconvene on a regular basis, going back to twice a week, and we were able to organize. I mean, the truth of the matter is that most of the organizations involved in um, the Coalition for Community are working with the same clients just for different reasons. Some of us focus on hunger. Some of us focus on STEM enrichment, science, technology, engineering, and math, like my group. Or some of us focus on mental health, for example, or healthcare. So essentially, we're working with the same clients, but just for different reasons. So what we did is we got together and we could focus our skills and energy and volunteer base to operationalize in for large scale engagement. And that's exactly what we've done. So how many organizations do you have involved right now? So, um, I mean, the list is, is quite long. I believe it's at least a dozen. Um, many of them are listed behind me on my green screen here. Um, and sometimes it varies. So, you know, Furniture Share House was not deeply engaged with us during the pandemic, but obviously following the flooding, they've really been very, very present and, and just a fantastic um, engaged partner with the coalition. We are not, the coalition is not its own nonprofit. We don't have bylaws. We don't have a structure. Um, we're rotating the leadership in terms of who calls the meetings and who takes the notes for the meetings on an annual basis. So I took the lead last year. This year we have Sarah Cody, um, who is also from the Hunger Task Force. So I think that, um, you know, we are both formal and informal in our nature. And so we're able to have people kind of weave in and out as they are needed. But you also have um, sort of a, a sign up sheet for things. And is that for one big, you know, for the whole group or individual groups underneath? Right. So we immediately started a volunteer list for the coalition. And um, we do have, for example, in this crisis right now um, for the uh, flood recovery and response, we have a single sign up that we're updating. And so we change it as needed as new needs arise. And I think what's incredibly important is that a lot of people have incredibly compassionate energy um, about how they want to help. But it's very, very important that we also learn how to listen. Um, I myself am not a flood victim. I myself am not low income. I myself am not a person of color. And it is very important that we learn in the coalition to listen to those who are very close to the clients about what is most needed. And so, and, and then tier our response accordingly. So that is why sometimes people say like, well, I wanna make food. Um, if there hasn't been a call for food, that might not be the right way to support right now. So we're able to really on these, um, like I said, often two or three times a week, we're really getting into the nitty gritty of what is most needed. And our signups reflect that. What is the interface between your, shall we call them member organizations or your coalition 
um, and governmental agencies. So the village of Ameranek is highly engaged with our coalition. Um, Tom Murphy's on the majority of the calls. And again, as needed, we can call different representatives in. Obviously the village of Ameranek, both during the pandemic in terms of um, working with low income individuals who were suffering food and economic loss during that time, or even right now with the flood, um, the village has been the municipal voice that's been of, of most critical importance. So you're finding that there's an overlap between those who needed help during the pandemic and those who have suffered during Hurricane Ida? Yes, um, absolutely. And I think the members of the Coalition for Understanding Racism Through Education, the, the group called CURE, which is one of our members, would say that that's not a coincidence. Um, that ultimately people who are from a low income background, often people of color, um, are disproportionately impacted um, by things that we all suffer, but um, that the impacts are more severe for them, such as, uh, you know, like I said, when there was food, you know, food shortages, the inability to go food shopping, um, the loss of income during the pandemic, or right now, the devastating damage and recovery following the, um, the, the flooding from Ida. What is the greatest need right now? Mm. So initially, we did literally need clothing. Um, we did literally need shoes. We needed toiletries. Um, we certainly needed uh, emergency housing um, and food. Um, at very, that was very much at the beginning of the, the crisis. But ultimately, this crisis is really about affordable housing. And that's going to be a lower, slow, slower uh, kind of conversation, um, a longer, slower conversation is what I mean, of high level importance, because the crisis of affordable housing predated the flooding. We know that um, people who needed affordable housing, who were struggling, were living in the area that was most impacted by the flooding. But the fact of the matter is, Westchester has had an affordable housing crisis long before the flooding happened. What we're seeing now is that those folks who lost those homes literally have nowhere to move to. There are no homes at that price point in Westchester County. But if you recall the lawsuit about West, um, affordable housing in Westchester, the village of Mamaroneck is actually one of the originally compliant communities. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we're talking about now, which would suggest that they had more affordable housing than other communities in the county. Am I misreading that? So I'm not going to say that I know the statistics on a point to point basis um, comparing uh, places in the, the county. But what it points out is that that still wasn't sufficient because I would agree with you. I think the village has taken um, their responsibility towards this issue seriously and has stepped up to implement that which is required and that which is right. Um, it's also not just about what's required, right? It's about just do the right thing. Um, these are folks who clean our um, properties. They mow our lawns. They care for our children. They shop in our local stores. Um, we want them to be able to have a safe and um, uh, you know, co cost efficient place to live according that is scalable according to their salaries, according to what we pay them um, and how their work is valued. So um, it's important that if we want those folks to do those services for us, we make sure that they have a way to live successfully. I think um, what you're really pointing to is that we did respond and we have required um, as much housing as we can, and it's still nowhere near enough. We know following the flooding that at least 150 families have been displaced, that several hundred people. Um, I personally was involved um, because of my work with the Coalition for Community. I was at the disaster services assistance site where FEMA, Red Cross, and the Department of Social Services were present. Um, I do speak Spanish, I'm not highly fluent, but I'm very competent. And I sat with families and interviewed them and talked to them as a part of that intake and heard firsthand stories of people sneaking back in to condemned buildings to sleep on dirty floors because they had nowhere else to go. I heard firsthand of people cohabitating with three families in a two bedroom apartment because they have nowhere else to go. I heard firsthand of a woman with three children sleeping in a park um, or in a car or this young man who took several dogs from the neighborhood because dogs can't go to emergency shelter and is living with them in a tent in the woods. So these are very urgent stories. Um, as I said, the, the crisis certainly forced those people on, out of challenging living situations into no living. Um, but our community is doing the best it can, but it's, it's, it's not enough. This is a Westchester County problem. 
So you see the coalition looking into longer term solutions, not just the volunteerism and the support needed right now. Yeah, I'm really glad that you raised that because we are thrilled that we can help put forward consistent messaging about the best ways to respond and provide help when a crisis arises, whether that be the pandemic. Um, we also responded when I think there were a couple of fires in a row in the village of Ameranek, you might recall, um, in the past 12 months or in this situation. But I think it's really important when folks act out of that tremendous, compassionate sense of urgency to help that we also pause and examine in our philanthropic efforts the balance between immediate action, food and shelter, and providing and donating to those causes that are looking at kind of solution-based actions. So education-based actions, programs that work on affordable housing, looking at root causes so that we balance our giving and our urgency to help with that which is both immediate and that is gonna provide sustainability and long-term solutions to the problems that are behind that need, that hunger, um, which is basically not having competitive um, not having competitive wages and not having consistent work and not having safe and affordable places to live. Well, I'm sure this is, there's gonna be many more conversations about this. Um, Meg, why don't you tell people how they can get involved right now if they want to? So the way to find us is through the Larchmont Mamaronek Coalition for Community Facebook page, LM Coalition for Community. There's a volunteer form that you can fill out. And anytime after our calls that we know what the needs are, we're gonna put it forward. Um, so whether that be drivers or preparing food or making donations and so forth, you're gonna be hearing from us as we build that volunteer list, which um, we're very thrilled has a very thick um, participation right now. Uh, we will push out messaging, requesting folks to step up and help. And then I think in the meanwhile, um, become familiar with the work of our groups um, where we are doing that long-term work around healthcare and education and affordable housing that's gonna create solutions so that hopefully each of these crises can have less of a traumatic impact on those who are most vulnerable in our community. We need to really create equity of opportunities um, before these crises happen. Ben Koifer, thank you for joining us. For LMC Media, I'm Maura Carlin. Mm -hmm.